Jake had proposed to young Gina would be interviewed by his prospective father-in-law. Father-in-law says, do you think you are earning enough to support a family? Young Jake said, yes, sir, I, I, I'm sure I am. Think carefully now, her father said. There are 12 of us. <laughs> You'll catch on in a minute. <laughs> the title of my sermon today is 2023, say, uh, New Year, same God. Look in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. You take your sword and open it up. Remember, always bring your sword to sword practice, although it's on the screen. It's good to know where it's at. Right? We're Hebrews chapter 12, focusing on verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. New year, same God. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word today, Father, just show us what you have us have for us in your word. Father, put your words in my mouth. It isn't me, it is you. And I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to look at three things we need to do according to God's word here in Hebrews for this new year. And it starts off with this phrase, Therefore, since we are surrounded by, by so great a cloud of witnesses. What does this mean? If you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it has been talking about the heroes of the faith. People like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and others. The heroes of the faith. And then it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. These witnesses, we are surrounded by them. So what does this mean? Does it mean that they are sitting in the stands watching us going, yeah, you go, yo, you're doing good, yeah, you're doing good. See, I don't see it that way. I think it means that they are down the track with us. They are coaching us. They are encouraging us. They are right there with us. I have a, have a picture, and this picture is of a, of a minister pre, pre, preaching and standing Right behind him, his right hand side is Jesus. And all behind him and surrounding him are the, are the heroes of the faith. And behind them are angels. And everybody has their hand on the one in front until they come down to the minister preaching and hands are on him as he is preaching. See, I believe that's the way we are surrounded by a great cloud of, wit of, wit of, uh, with, uh, wit of witnesses is they're not just saying, yeah, you go. But they're encouraging. They're putting their hands on us, praying for us. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. 2023 is here. Can you believe it? 2023? Man, I remember when year 1999 was like the magical year. You remember the old Quantum Leap show? It happened in the future, 1999. We're supposed to have flying cars by now. Didn't you see the movie Back to the Future Part 2? We're past that date. My car doesn't fly. If it does, I'll get a ticket. <laughs>
here, let's make it better. God wants to spiritually prosper us in the new year. He wants us to have the best year in Him that we have ever had. And then in my sermon today, I'm going to be speaking a blessing over you for 2023. I'm just giving you a fair warning. If you don't want a blessing, you better leave. You didn't leave. All right. So in the new year, we need to, number one, give even our deepest sin to Jesus. It says, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. God has saved us from our sin. Do we understand that part? Right? Jesus came down on the cross. We asked Jesus to forgive us. God has forgiven us of our sin if we have asked him to. Had a lady this week at the hospital. I was called to go talk to her. She had been given a diagnosis which was not good. And I was able to speak to her and lay the word out to her. And she accepted Jesus for the first time in her life. And I told her, you know what just happened? Just, happened, just happened, happened here? You're a new creation. Your old is gone. The new is here. Your sins are gone. And you made angels celebrate in heaven. My Bible tells me when a sinner gets saved, a party breaks out in heaven. God has saved us from our sin. He has given us His Holy Spirit. But in spite of that, He has provided. But the average Christian still stumbles and falls, right? Everything God's given us, forgives for our sins, gives us the Holy Spirit, we still stumble and fall. We still fall down. We still wander like a man lost in the dark. What is wrong with the Christian life the way it's being lived in this present day? I believe the problem is that Christians do not go on with God. They get saved, give a testimony of their salvation, they join the church, and that's as far as they go with it. They never maintain a serious study of God's Word, which is essential to our spiritual growth. We must maintain serious study of God's Word in order to grow in the Lord. We've got to know His Word. We can carry it around with us all day long. But if we're not reading that and studying it, it doesn't get into us. Our heart, our head, our spirit. That's the way we grow in the Lord. It's like the girl who went to bed one night, she falls out of bed, she begins to cry, her mama comes in, she says, honey, why did you fall out of the bed? And she says, I think I stayed too close to the place I got in. <laughs> well, see, that's the problem with too many Christians today, we stay too close to the place we got in. And we don't go deeper and further in the Lord. It says, the sin which clings so closely. This means those secret sins, the ones that cling close to you, that we keep hidden. We must confess all of our sin, even the ones which cling so closely. We've got to confess those things. Those things which we try to keep hidden from everybody, including God. It doesn't work. God always knows. We need to confess those sins. Lay them at His feet. Give them over to Him. In the new year, we also need to, number two, never give up. It says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's get into that race. Let's get moving. And not just drift along. We're racers. Zoe ran track this past year. She ran the, I don't know what it was, the one you take about 1,500 laps around this track, you know? You run forever. She never ran that before, and she ran it this year. And her first race, Brie wasn't trained very well in it. 
All these girls sprinted out there, and she just took off her own pace. We watched, though. She just kept gaining and gaining, just passing one girl at a time until she was in first place. What did she do? She didn't give up. She continued on with endurance. The race was set before her. Spiritually, we need to carry on with endurance the race that is set before us. We each have the same race, but we each have a different race. You understand that? We have the race set before us. Okay? Now, do you know that this is a race that we can all win? You know, when you race, you have one winner on that track. In this race, we can all win. In this race, we can all win, but it takes due diligence. We must study God's Word. I mean really study it this year. Not just when we come to class or we come to church, but every day, study the Word. I say we should read the Word and study the Word. It's two different things. I read every morning. Read my Bible every morning, first thing. I study later. What do I do when I read? It just refreshes my soul. When I study, it's when I get in deep in the Word and I start learning what these things mean. And the more you do that, the more you learn how the Word just all ties together. It's such a wonderful thing. You know, one of the greatest dangers in the Christian life is that of remaining stationary, of doing nothing. If you stay too long in the extreme cold, what's going to happen? Well, you can freeze to death, right? We had some extreme cold here not very long ago. A couple of years ago, we had a long, extended, hard freeze. You get out there walking around in that cold, stay out there, you're going to be, you're going to be dead, right? 39, 40 years ago, we're living up in Colorado and and. It's, you know, wintertime. It's 40 below at night. It's, it's, it's winter. It's cold. And, and we lived out of my brother-in-law's farm about 25 miles from town in the middle of nothing. I mean, it's on a farm. And, and we both worked in towns. So we drove the snowy roads going in town every day. And, and this one morning I was leaving early. I was going to meet the transport driver about 4.30 in the morning. And I had to drive into Platteville to meet him, to ride with him, learn his route. And so we had a little gremlin that I was drive, driving, and the heater didn't work in it. I needed to pull the heater core out and get it flushed. I hadn't done it yet. It's okay, I bundled up. I was nice and warm. I drove. Well, this morning it was snow packed, really packed, and that little car lost control, spun out, ended up in the ditch. I was a ways from home. I was a ways from anywhere. So I had this choice to make. Do I sit in this car and wait for several hours for somebody to come by, hopefully come by, and give me a ride, or do I walk? So I decided I'm going to walk. And I've got my insulated boots on, insulated coveralls. I've got a, a cap on, a stocking cap over that. I have a red Phillips 66 coat on, a nice warm coat, my insulated gloves, and and so I got started walking, hands in my pockets, had my face covered up. And I walked about a mile to the first house, and then about, I got another mile to our house or a quarter mile to their door, and I thought, I better try to get to their door. I was already getting so cold that I was watching my feet thinking, step, 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 knowing that if I fell down, I couldn't get up. I was already getting to the point I was so cold I wouldn't get cold anymore. It's, you know, one of the first steps of hypothermia is when you're not cold anymore. I knew things were getting serious. So I walked down the lane and their big dogs woke up and came out and I thought, bite me. I don't care. I won't feel it. Go ahead. So I got up and I knocked on his door. No answer. I thought, well, I'm going to try again. And if they don't answer, I'll just walk on home. And it's not as cold as it was. <coughs> so I knocked again. I waited a minute. Pretty soon the porch light comes on. And, and, and Bill Franks opens up the door, but he didn't know me. What I didn't realize was my red Phillips 66 coat was white because of frost, as was my face. And he saw me, but he didn't recognize me. 
And then his eyes got real big of, and he grabbed my coat and yanked me in the house. And his wife got up and they started unzipping my coat, trying to get some heat to my body. And she started fixing something warm for me to drink. I was just trying to ask him to drive me home. And I couldn't even talk. He told my wife later, he says, he doesn't know how close to dead he was. All I had to do to freeze to death was nothing. All I had to do was lay down and go to sleep. That's all I had to do. Too many believers today are spiritually freezing to death because they're doing nothing. All I had to do to freeze to death was stop moving. That's all I had to do. In a spiritual sense, the danger is the same for all of us. We must force ourselves to stay awake, keep moving forward in our relationship with Christ, otherwise we'll just, we'll just fall asleep. At all time can't be. West Texas, years ago, this, this little old lady gets up and she gave her testimony. She said, Lord, fill my cup up 20 years ago. Nothing's run in and nothing's run out. And this old cowboy in the back speaks up and says, I bet it's filled with wiggle tails by now. <laughs> you see, if nothing runs in, nothing runs out, it becomes stale. We as believers need to be splashing out everything in us on somebody else and let God refill us every day. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be fresh. In order to run this race, we must keep moving. We must be getting filled up, and we must be pouring out every day. And if we're carrying around the extra weight of our sin, even those which cling so closely, those hidden from everybody except God, it will cause us to lose the race. Philipp, in the book of Philipp, uh, Philipp, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now that part of the verse is kind of hard to take sometimes. Do all things without griping and complaining. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the, to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or, in, or labor in vain. That's Paul speaking there. He said we need to run that race and do it with due diligence so at the end we say we didn't do this in vain. We didn't do it in vain. Right? In the new year, we also need to, number three, fix our eyes on Jesus. It says, looking to Jesus. We must look to Jesus and fix our eyes on him. Remember when, when Peter tells Jesus that's really him to call him out, he'll step out of the boat. You know, when, when they're worried about going down and Jesus comes walking on the water. Remember that? Jesus, if it's really you, call to me and I'll step out of the boat. He says, Peter, come on. What does Peter do? He steps out of that boat on to the water. How many of you ever tried to walk on water? Doesn't work too good, does it? Peter walked on the water to Jesus. And as long as his focus was on Jesus, he was walking on the water. But when he began to focus on the waves around him, the Bible says he began to to sink. That's always been a curious phrase to me. Anytime I ever stepped on water, I didn't begin to sink. I just fell in. <laughs> How about you? He began to sink, and what happened? He just took his hand and he stepped back on top of the water. Remember that? As long as we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, we're going to walk. We take our eyes off, we begin to sink. Right? Our eyes must be fixed on him, not looking to the right, not looking to the left, but 
looking right at him, not being distracted by anything around us, but fixed solidly on Jesus. We need to fix our eyes on him. Peter cried, Lord help me, Lord save me. Why do we need to fix our eyes <clears throat> on Jesus? Well, let me tell you, because he is the founder and perfecter of the faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He brings it to maturity and perfect, perfect perfection. He began and finished the race we are in. He is our leader and instructor. He is the pioneer of our faith. That's why. We are encouraged by these witnesses. They are not spectators. They are testifying to us. They are cheering us on, encouraging us to run the Christian race, to continue in this Christian life. Abraham is saying, step out in faith. Moses is saying, step out in faith. Daniel is saying, step out in faith. The heroes of the faith are saying, step out in faith. I want to encourage you to step out in faith. I want to read to you from the complete Jewish Bible, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Throw three dry this morning. It says, So then, since we are surrounded by such a great, great cloud of, wit of witnesses, let us too put aside every impediment that is a sin which easily hampers our forward move movement and keep ready with endurance the contest set before us, looking away to the initiator and completer of that trust, trust, trusting Yahshua, who in exchange for obtaining the joy set before him, endured execution on a stake as a criminal, scorning the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, think about him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you won't grow tired and become despondent. You have, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding blood in the contest against sin. <clears throat> Imitation this morning, I want to ask you, are you running the race with endurance? Or do you grow weary and just sit down and wait for the race to be over? Are you laying every weight and sin at Jesus' feet? Or do you continue to try and carry it all on your own. Are we looking to Jesus? The one who is the founder of our faith. Not only did he found it, but he perfected it. Are we looking to Jesus or do we look to ourselves? Self-help only works when self is perfect and has all the answers. Remember, Self-help got us into the mess. Only Jesus can get us out of it. Why? Because he is seated at the right hand of God. I want to read from the ESV, Ephesians 12, 5 through 8. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure God. <clears throat> it, is, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God has treated you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not this, this, this discipline. If you have left, if you are left without this, this discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. 
Where do we stand today? Are we being disciplined as a son? You see, discipline doesn't feel good. But discipline is necessary. Sometimes God has to get on to us and say, hey, what about that sin that claims so closely to you? Why aren't you giving it to me? Why aren't you turning away from that? What about those burdens you're carrying? Why aren't you trying to put those at my feet? Why are you trying to carry them on your own? Sometimes God's got to get on to us. We need to receive this and celebrate in it. Why? Because he's saying, you're your you're, you're son. If I didn't care, right? Why do we discipline our kids? Because we love them. We want them to turn out to be the best they can. We need to lay that sin, that burden at the feet of Jesus and then leave it there. And stand up straight as a son of the Most High God. I want to give us a chance to do that. We're going to pray softly for just a minute. And then I want to speak a blessing over you. Let's take a minute and just do business with God. What is it He has spoken to you about in your life and you lay at His feet? What is it you need to ask forgiveness for? Let's do that right now. Let's start the year off right. Father, forgive us where we fall short. Forgive us of our sin. Relieve us of that burden. Take that weight off of us. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name. Now I want to speak a New Year's blessing over you.
So church, God bless you in the new year because he loves you and wants you to pro prosper. 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul pros prospers. Church, I pray that God bless you in the new year because he has good things in store for you. I pray that God bless you in the new year because his blessings will bring you joy and peace. I pray that God bless you in the new year because his blessings will help us overcome challenges. So Father, bless us in this new year. But Father, let us remember to bless you and be grateful, be thankful, and recognize all blessings come from you. Father, I pray that you will bless us and bless this church. In Jesus' name, amen.